Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar this afternoon on the birds and habitat of the Rio Grande. Our wonderful avian biologist over out of New Mexico is going to be giving you a really nice overview. And so thanks for participating. Just know um, that as you join, you'll be muted. And so if you have any questions for us, please drop them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, and also, we're just really happy to be able to um, offer this webinar to everyone for free. And so um, if you check the chat box, there'll be a donation um, link. So if, you, so if you can give, we encourage you to do so. And just as a heads up, um, if you exit out of the webinar, an exit survey will appear in a pop-up where you can just let us know what the experience like was like, um, if you like the webinar, what you would like to improve so that we can continue to really just cultivate this spring webinar series for our folks. You're learning a lot and really getting the content that you'd like. So um, we still have a number of people joining. So again, just um, give us a couple of minutes and we'll get started once we're at capacity. And just again, as a reminder, if you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the chat. And our um, education uh, director, Katie Weeks, will also be um, dropping relevant links and answering quick questions in the chat as well. Thanks for your patience. Uh, thanks, Desiree, for that intro. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, this is Amy Erickson. I'm the avian biologist for Audubon, New Mexico. And this is the second in our three-part Rio Grande webinar series. Um, so if you tuned in last month, the Director of Freshwater Conservation, Paul Tashin, gave a really cool overview of the Rio Grande and why it's important and how it's managed and what that means for birds and for people. Um, on this webinar, I'm going to be talking more about the specific birds that we all um, enjoy here in the Rio Grande and talking about some species and why they're cool and the kind of habitat that, that they use. So before I get started, um, I just want to mention that we do have a couple other webinars coming up. The next one is on July 7th, and it's how to advocate for birds, wildlife, and people. And that will be presented by Judy Kalman. She's our director of policy. And then on July 21st, we have Quantina Martin. She's giving the third in our Rio Grande webinar series, um, working for the Rio Grande. So she'll be talking about um, the work we're doing on the Rio Grande and some of our partnerships in the area. And then I just have some um, links to our social media below, and Katie's going to be dropping some more of those in the chat box as we go along. So if you want to um, stay in touch or get more information, you can definitely visit some of those sites. So um, where birds thrive, people prosper. And these species that you see on the screen here, yellow warbler, willow flycatcher, yellow-billed cuckoo, spotted towhee, Sandhill Crane are just a few of the really cool and beautiful species that we have here in the Rio Grande Valley. And these birds depend on Audubon. And Audubon does a lot of really interesting work here in New Mexico. Um, we work with local and state agencies to do all sorts of interesting conservation work. Um, we have a ribbon, ribbon of Life initiative that's focused on the Rio Grande specifically. Um, and so I'll just show you a map of where I do my work. Um, you can see Socorro County, which is highlighted in that, that graphic on the right. And I live in Socorro County. It's just south of Albuquerque, right along the Rio Grande. Um, and the map on the left just shows the full extent of the Rio Grande. As you can see, it starts in Colorado and comes all the way through the state of New Mexico and down into Texas, where it forms the southern border with Mexico and then dumps out into the Gulf of Mexico. So it's, it's a huge river. It's a really amazing river. But where I work is focused on the middle Rio Grande, and that is kind of defined as the area between Cochiti Lake, which is on Cochiti Pueblo, which is north of Albuquerque a little bit, kind of between Albuquerque and Santa Fe, um, and then south to Elephant Butte Reservoir, which is the largest lake in New Mexico which is just uh, south of the border of Socorro County near the town of Truth or Consequences. And I'm going to be talking a lot about the bosque. So the bosque is kind of a, a local word that you hear a lot in New Mexico and in some of these western riparian areas. 
for the riparian forest um, that's dominated by cottonwoods and willows. So the volsca is super important for all these bird species that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and it's, it's particularly important here in the arid southwest because, um, like I mentioned, we have a whole river, river of life initiative because the Rio Grande is the river of life for New Mexico. It supports almost all of the bird species that, that you see here. Um, not to mention agriculture and humans. I mean, mo the, the vast majority of the population of New Mexico lives along the Rio Grande. Um, and it's essential habitat for birds and wildlife in New Mexico. So that's why it's super important um, for us to kind of focus on this area and um, to partner with all these different local and state agencies and private landowners and, and, and all sorts of different people doing really important work in the bosque. So the, the cottonwood and willow dominated bosque is something I'll keep coming back to because these, these two plant species, um, they really form the backbone of this whole ecosystem and support a wide variety of species. So I'm just going to show you a few photos um, to kind of get you oriented about the Rio Grande and the bosque and also to talk about some projects that Audubon is working on. So we're taking aerial imagery of some of our current and future habitat restoration sites just for monitoring purposes to see how our how our project sites change and grow over time and also just because it's really interesting to see what the river looks like at different flow levels and um, just to see how the trees are doing. So in this picture this is a actually a private ranch that has had some work done on it. Over on the left side of the picture you see these bare areas and those were intentionally created to form shallow backwater habitat to benefit the Rio Grande silvery minnow and um, eventually those habitat sites will grow up into really cool um, bosque habitat that will benefit lots of different bird species. And here's here's a really cool photo that um, Quinn and I took just north of Socorro. It's looking west, kind of northwest across the Rio Grande towards the town of Limitar. And you can really see how the river is connected to all of the agriculture that that surrounds both sides of the river through through most of the middle Rio Grande area. Um, all these farm fields are irrigated with Rio Grande water and it's it's a precious resource in the West and it's um, definitely important to, to keep these farming communities alive because they promote all sorts of wetland habitat for birds um, as well as keeping this bosque healthy um, now and into the future. So that's one project that I'm kind of working on. I just wanted to mention this Working Lands for Wildlife program. It's through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And they have a special initiative that's focused just on um, riparian habitat restoration, specifically targeted at the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But if, if you're a landowner or you know somebody who might be interested in doing some riparian habitat restoration, um, Anywhere on this map that's got the orange color is one of the focal areas for NRCS. And I've circled on the map Socorro County so you can kind of see that's what I'm working with. That's kind of the area I'm working on. Um, but it's a really cool program that helps landowners get financial and technical assistance to do things like remove invasive plant species and do habitat restoration where we come in and put in um, more native species. and all sorts of cool stuff to benefit, not just the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher, but all sorts of species that use the riparian bosque. Okay, done with the background. Now we're gonna get into what I'm sure everybody really wants to see is some of the really cool birds that we have here in the Rio Grande. Um, so this, this is kind of gonna be a deep dive into six of my favorite riparian species. And I chose these six because Either they're really interesting or they're ones that you're likely to see in the bosque this time of year. Um, and, you know, some identif identification tips and um, information on their habitat. I'll talk a little bit about their biology, their conservation status, and then some info about the taxonomy of the bird and their scientific names and what they mean. And I wish I could have included more birds in this talk because they're all really cool and they all have something special that's interesting to learn about them, but I just chose six. So um, hopefully they're ones that, that interest you and that you feel like you wanna come out in the bosque and try to find. 
So the first bird I'm going to talk about is the southwestern willow flycatcher. So I mentioned that there's a working lands for wildlife program that's targeting habitat restoration for this species. And that's because the southwestern willow flycatcher has been on the endangered species list since 1995. Um, and it's, it was put on the endangered species list because of loss of habitat. So it's really closely associated with these cottonwood, willow, bosquet type habitats that you see around the river. And you might notice in every single one of these photos that looks like they're perched on a willow. Um, so willow flycatcher, that's their preferred habitat. Um, and the willows almost always grow either right on the water's edge or really close to the water or have moist soil underneath them. So this bird really likes these kind of brushy, moist soil, um, dense riparian habitat. And that's becoming increasingly rare for, for a number of reasons, but that's why this bird is the subject of a lot of um, restoration projects and interests, not just in the middle Rio Grande, but kind of throughout the West. And we call these swiffles. Um, just instead of saying Southwestern willow flycatcher, we call them swiffles. Um, it's one of five subspecies of the willow flycatcher. And the willow flycatcher is is not not rare. Um, it's widely distributed, especially in the eastern parts of the U.S. and up into Canada. But the um, southwestern subspecies is super rare. Um, actually, in New Mexico, it's only estimated that we have about 800 to 900 individual birds, and the majority of those are actually in the middle Rio Grande, which is really cool that we have so many um, of these swiffles here, which means we have a lot of good habitat in the area. Um, and in total. Um, their whole population of southwestern willow flycatchers is only about 2,400 individuals. And they're really hard to photograph and they're really hard to survey. So if you see the picture on my left, I think that is a possible contender for a 2020 Audubon Photography Awards. That's my amazing picture of the southwestern willow flycatcher. <laughs> and the picture on the right is actually on the cover of the official U.S. Fish and Wildlife Survey Protocol. And as you can see, um, they're really hard to photograph. They're very small and they're usually 10 or 15 feet above you and they're extremely fast and just jump from branch to branch. So that picture in the middle is, is a willow flycatcher, um, a whiffle, so not a swiffle, but I wanted to put that picture on there just so you could get a good idea of what the bird looks like. And I don't have any audio on this webinar just because I didn't want to take too much time um, dealing with, with the audio issues, but if you want to go on some of the bird guide apps or websites, you can easily find um, information and bird songs and stuff for these species. So the Southwestern Willow flycatcher says, it's few, it's few. And that's really the only way you can identify them. Um, they look so much like other birds in the bosque. They're just little gray flycatchers. Um, so if you see one, you really can't confidently identify them unless you hear them making that sound. And so I got really interested in what all the scientific names mean of these species. So I'm really interested in like the taxonomy of these species and why they're called what they're called. So the scientific name of the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher is Impidinax trailii. And it was formerly lumped with the alder flycatcher as one species, the trails flycatcher. Um, but new, due to recent genetic and DNA analysis, scientists have actually realized that it was two species. So now we have the willow flycatcher um, and the alder flycatcher. And if you break down what their scientific name means, the Greek word impus means gnat, and the Greek word anax is master. So it is literally a gnat master, because <laughs> they that's their main food source is just tiny flying insects. So they're, they're really cool guys to have around, uh, because they eat lots of gnats and lots of mosquitoes and things that annoy people. Um, and trailii is for the Scottish zoologist Thomas Stewart Trail. So Trail's gnat master is the literal definition of the southwestern willow flycatcher. So the next bird I'm going to talk about is probably, I don't know if I want to say it's my favorite bird on here. It's, it's a close contender. It might be my favorite. Um, this is the yellow-billed cuckoo, Coxizus americanus. And like the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher, it's also listed under the Endangered Species Act, but it is not listed as endangered, it's listed as threatened. Um, and threatened is basically one step better than endangered because threatened means if we don't step in and do some conservation for the species, then it's likely to become endangered in the future. So threatened um, is not, not so dire of a situation as endangered. 
and kind of like the southwestern willow flycatcher, the entire population of yellow-billed cuckoos is doing fairly well, um, especially in the east. But the western distinct population segment is what is listed on listed as threatened. Um, so it's not a genetically distinct subpopulation, but it's a western population that uses a different migratory path and doesn't mix really with the the main um, group of cuckoos in the east. So. It's uh, basically using these riparian corridors like the Rio Grande that are found throughout the arid southwest. And it really has kind of a specialized diet. It eats a lot of hairy caterpillars, so tank caterpillars and, you know, things that other birds don't want to eat because they're covered in these really nasty long hairs. Um, and these pictures are actually taken by my husband. We used to live in Kansas, and cuckoos are super common in a lot of the riparian areas in Kansas. So we're um, lucky enough that we got to see a lot of them up close, including this guy. We we captured these photos of him eating these little tent caterpillars on a on a sumac tree. And so the scientific name for the cuckoo isn't quite as cool as the Impidonex flycatchers. It basically comes from the ancient Greek word for the common cuckoo, and Americanus just means American. So it's the American cuckoo. Um, and here's some more photos so you can just see how pretty this bird is. He's got this nice yellow eye ring, got these really pretty um, rufous color on the wing. And if I go back to this photo, you can see these nice big white spots on the tail. So they've got these six big spots on the tail, which is you, you would instantly know it was a cuckoo if it flew over you because um, of those really pretty spots. And at least where I'm from in Kansas, a lot of people call this bird the rain crow. Um, because they say that it likes to call right before a thunderstorm rolls in, which I'm not sure if it's true or not, but it's just a cool story. Okay, so this is why I think the cuckoo is like the coolest bird. So this picture is a five day old cuckoo chick and he is just absolutely covered in pin feathers. And what's super amazing about this bird's biology is from the start of incubation to fledging, so when the baby bird leaves the nest, is only 17 days. So it goes from an egg to a fully flighted adult bird practically in 17 days. And that is actually one of the fastest known um, growth periods of any bird in the entire world. So it's super cool. And at about age five or six days, all these feather sheaths just burst open all at the same time. And then the cuckoo chick spends a couple hours furiously preening himself, opening those feather sheets. And it goes from looking like this crazy little pin cushion, little baby bird to fully feathered. Like it's, and then it can fly just a couple days later. And they grow super, super fast. It's amazing. Um, so that really tells you how important having a good food source is for these birds on their, on their breeding ground, which is here in the middle Rio Grande. So they're they're closely associated with um, you know these riparian bosques that have a dense understory. They have a huge foraging habitat, and they really need plants um, that can be host to lots of different insect, butterfly, and moth larvae because that's what they're eating. So when when we're doing restoration projects that are targeted towards cuckoo and flycatcher habitat, um, you know it's not enough just to think about oh, let's just plant some cottonwoods and willows um, because that's what, what they like. But they also have, you know, these food requirements that are that are difficult to meet with these birds that grow so incredibly quickly. I mean, you have to think the parents are feeding five or six of these. So um, it's really important that they have a good prey base. And the cuckoos in, in particular have really big home ranges. So they're actually ranging um, a couple hundred hectares in some cases to find food for their young. Okay, so the next bird of the bosque is the yellow-breasted chat, Icteria virens. And this is just the craziest sounding bird you've ever heard. So if you're ever walking around in the riparian habitat of the Rio Grande and you hear just some wild and crazy sounds coming from a bush that you can't pinpoint and you don't see a bird, it's probably a chat. Um, so I'm gonna read some descriptions of the chat's call. And I really encourage you to go online and find um, a recording of a chat's call or even go out in the bosque and see if you can find one yourself because they're really interesting. Um, so here's one description of a yellow breasted chat by an early ornithologist. He called it a medley of strange sounds, musical and otherwise, cat calls, whistles, and various bird notes coming from points now here, now there in the bushes will betray the presence of this furtive and elusive clown among birds. 
And another description of their call is males have a large repertoire of songs made up of whistles, cackles, mews, catcalls, caw notes, chuckles, rattles, squeaks, gurgles, and pops, which they repeat and string together with great variety. So you can see it's almost impossible to describe what a chat sounds like. It's basically um, just any sound it wants to make, and it includes its own songs and mimic, mimicked, um, or mimicked phrases from other species in its environment. So this was probably my favorite uh, little tidbit that I dug up when I was researching scientific names. So what the heck does icteria mean? Well, apparently it was an ancient Greek belief that if you were suffering from jaundice, you could be cured of jaundice by simply looking at a chat. So <laughs> if you're feeling unwell, I guess go out in the bosque and try to find a chat and that will cure you of your jaundice. Um, and the species name virens means vigorous, which I, I, a lot of these scientific names, you know, they were named a long time ago, in some cases hundreds of years ago, and it's kind of unknown what the, the person who named it really meant when they were coming up with these scientific names. So could mean vigorous, which is probably the case because they're really vigorous songsters and they're really active little birds. Could mean headed, like yellow headed um, or something like that. So gazing upon a chat probably can't cure your jaundice. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever studied it. Maybe it can. Um, but the healing power of birds and nature has been studied and is definitely true. So there's just all sorts of information out there about the healing power of nature and, and how birds provide a benefit to people, um, including improving our mental mindset. Um, there's some studies that show people living in environments where they're more connected with nature and are closer to birds, shrubs, and trees are less likely to feel depressed or anxious or feel feelings of stress. Um, there's all sorts of animal therapies out there, including ones with birds and companion parrots and treating um, all sorts of ailments. And, um, you know, I, I, I like to think that the Greeks came up with this whole jaundice thing because if you go out in nature and you see a really cool bird like a chat, I mean, how can you, how could that not make you feel better um, about, about yourself and about the state of the world? So the next bird, this is the summer tanager. And this is one of the coolest birds to see when you're in the bosque. It's just this bright red. Um, they're super common. So if you're, uh, this, this is probably the most common bird that I see in Socorro um, right now. Like I can go out in the bosque or not even in the bosque, just kind of around town. And you can see these birds just singing away. Um, they're kind of, a confusing bird to ID because unlike the, the three species I've already talked about, these have completely different um, plumages for the males and the females. So the adult male is the bright red guy um, and the female is kind of a duller olive drab color. It's it's kind of hard, hard to identify the females because the females of lots of different bird species are just kind of this olive drab color. Um, and, and I get some photos it to me sometimes or if you look at some of the like Facebook bird ID groups and stuff a lot of times these immature male summer tanagers pop up because it just looks so crazy it's like they they start out when the males are young looking like the female looking more camouflaged when they're they're young you know like most birds do but then over the course of their um, journey into adulthood they molt their juvenile plumage and turn into the adult male color but there's this in-between period where they're kind of modeled crazy looking yellow red with um, all these cool patterns and stuff so if you see that out in the field you're like what the heck is that but it's um it's an immature male summer tanager and he's just getting ready to become his full glorious red color um, and th these are um, really vigorous songsters so they have a song similar to an american robin is how it's usually described um, it's just kind of a slow cheery up cheery cheery up cheery that you hear um, up high in the tree canopy. And these birds are, I see them all the time in the cottonwoods. So they're really strongly associated with those cottonwoods, with the tall canopy, with the healthy riparian bosque. Um, so another reason that we have a lot of them around the middle Rio Grande, because we just have a lot of really cool habitat left here. And this bird's cool. Um, it's primary prey base is actually insects like stinging insects, so bees and wasps. So 
so they um, they will find a wasp or a bee, and if you if you watch them after he captures one of those insects, they'll beat it on the side of a branch or just rub it on the side of a branch, and they're trying to get that stinger off, and then they can eat it. So these are good guys to have around too if you're having a wasp problem or a bee problem. You can um, invite some summer tanagers over to your house, and maybe they can help you out with that. Um, and this other picture is one that I actually took. Uh, just east of Socorro in the riparian bosque along one of the riverine parks and trails. And like I mentioned, they're all over and they seem to be pretty accommodating to you taking photos, which is great. Um, you can get some really stunning photos if you are just patient. And their scientific name, Piranga rubra, is from the Tupi word, which is a tribe in Brazil. So these birds, um, you know, you can see them in North America, you can see them in Central America, you can see them in South America. But the tanager family is actually really widespread. Um, but this Tupi word, Tihe Paranga, means an unknown small bird. Um, so I like to imagine that the early ornithologists were asking the tribes, hey, what is this bird? And the guy says, I don't know, it's just some small bird. And then <laughs> they decided to name it that because they thought that that's what it really meant. Um, and then the, the species rubra is the Latin word for red. So it's basically just, we don't know what this small red bird is. So um, the next bird on my list is the ash-throated flycatcher, Myarchus cinerisin. And this bird, it, it's not a riparian obligate like the other species are. So the, the ones I mentioned, you, you pretty much are only going to see them around the river. You're pretty much only going to see them where you have these dense cottonwood bosques, where you have coyote willow, and you have just um, open water habitat and flowing water. Whereas the ash-throated flycatchers are kind of more of a desert riparian gener generalist species, which um, is it's it's just indicative of the Rio Grande. I mean, it's it's really amazing how you can be right next to the Rio Grande and feel like you're in the forest and you're surrounded by these tall trees and this dense canopy that's so dense you can hardly even walk through and it's humid and it's shady and it's cool and then you walk you know a hundred yards away from the main channel and now you're in this literally desert upland scrub habitat with cactuses and and yuccas and stuff like that so it's, it's a really interesting transition zone and I think the ash-throated flycatchers are really into that. So you see them a lot in the bosque, and you also see them in the dry upland areas eating berries and kind of associated with the, you know, some of the juniper habitat or some of the um, mesquite upland habitat. And I was trying to do some research on this bird and find some cool facts about it. And unfortunately, it's pretty understudied for being a really common and widespread species, which you kind of find that a lot with birds, unfortunately, is the things like the, the southwestern willow flycatcher that are on the endangered species list get a lot of attention and get a lot of study and get a lot of research. And it seems like, wow, we know a whole lot about this bird, even though, you know, there's only 2,400 individuals um, in the whole world. And then you have that ash-throated flycatcher, which is super widely distributed and really common. And we really don't know much about it. Like, we're not sure what its breeding strategy is or how it chooses a mate or does it have multiple nests in a year. Um, so I, I know I, I, I really want to advocate for, you know, these common birds are just as interesting as the ones that are more rare. And, you know, if you're if you're into birds, then, you know, definitely take a second look at some of these species that you might think, oh, they're not that interesting because they really are. Um, and this guy, I read that he can get all the water that it needs from food, so it doesn't actually need to drink. So it makes sense when you think it's not so closely tied to the riparian areas, it can kind of use these upland areas as well. Um, and getting all its food from insects, and then in the winter it kind of transitions to a more fruit-based diet, like, like a lot of insectivorous birds do. And this one has kind of a cool scientific name too. Um, Myarchus is from a couple Greek words for fly, and then another word, arcos, for ruler or chief. So what this bird scientific name means is lord of the flies. So they're really good aerial insectivores. They're kind of like our friend the gnat master, the willow flycatcher who's targeting those really small flying insects like gnats and mosquitoes, whereas these myarchus flycatchers, and there's a number of them um, in this genus that look similar and have similar behaviors that are just amazing to watch when they're 
flying from perch to perch to um, grab an insect out of the air. So they're really, um, really acrobatic and really interesting birds. Okay, so I have one more bird to talk about. And before I bring him up on the screen, I want to read a sentence from an article I found by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center about this bird. Um, and maybe it, it's not a real riparian obligate, but you do see it a lot in the bosque, and it's a bird that's super interesting to me specifically and a lot of other people. Um, so here's what that article said by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. Perhaps no bird species in North America elicits a more emotional response from birders and researchers alike than this species. They are fascinating to many for having maybe the most unusual breeding biology of any bird on the continent yet reviled by many more for their reputation as cheats with poor family values. <laughs> so I feel like that's a little harsh, but maybe you guess the bird I'm talking about is the brown-headed cowbird. Um, so the reason I put this bird on the list, like I mentioned, they are, they are riparian species. And if you go out in the bosque right now, you're almost guaranteed to see brown-headed cowbirds and small flocks kind of foraging for insects and stuff like that. But the reason this bird is so controversial is because of its interesting breeding strategy where the female does not make a nest of her own. The female cowbird never makes a nest, doesn't have any instinct to make a nest. So baby cowbirds are always hatched in another bird's nest. Um, and that means they're obligate brood parasites. So they're always raised by another species. And this is because this bird evolved on the short grass prairie of North America to follow the herds of bison across the plains. And those bison would like kick up all sorts of insects and stuff and the, that the cowbirds would eat, but then they would move on to a new foraging patch. So if the cowbirds wanted to follow the bison and follow that food resource, they didn't really have the luxury of staying in one spot for a month and a half or two months to raise their young. So they evolved to take advantage of these other birds in the area and, you know, let them raise their babies for them. Um, and they do have some host species that they prefer. Usually birds that are um, similar or slightly smaller bodied than the cowbirds are preferred hosts, but they've actually been recorded laying their eggs in the nest of at least 220 species including, and I didn't know this until I started researching them a little bit more for this talk, ruby-throated hummingbirds, which is kind of amazing to me because if you've ever seen a picture of a ruby-throated hummingbird nest, they're about the size of a thimble. Um, so I don't even know how a single cowbird egg would fit inside a ruby-throated hummingbird nest, let alone be incubated by the mother. I'm sure it, uh, it wasn't a successful nest. Um, and ferruginous hawks, which is a huge hawk um, that's almost the size of an eagle. So this little cowbird, which is, you know, starling size, a little bit larger than a sparrow, is so bold that it thinks, I'm going to lay my egg in this ferruginous hawk's nest and let the ferruginous hawk mother feed my baby. <laughs> this thinks they're so awesome. Um, and so obviously, you know, it's probably not a good idea to lay your egg in a ferruginous hawk's nest, but 144 species have actually been documented um, raising a cowbird young to fledging. Um, and the one on the bottom is a common yellow throat, which is a pretty common riparian bosque species that is still tending to its enormous cowbird um, adopted baby. So you can see how uh, it could be kind of a struggle for some of these mother birds to feed these giant cowbird babies. And there's a lot of cool, like new information about cowbirds. And, you know, for a long time, it was, we didn't really know, like, how, how can a bird be raised by another species and know how, how to be a cowbird? Like, if this cowbird is raised by a common yellow throat, how does it know that it's a cowbird? How does it, you know, how does it learn how to be a cowbird? And, there, there was some really cool recent studies within the last five or six years looking at the behavior of these young cowbirds. And, you know, it was thought for a long time that the mother just deposited an egg in a nest and then that was the end of the parental care. But in reality, they've found out, researchers, researchers have found out that not only do the mother cowbirds check on their eggs, but the young cowbirds will leave the nest at night, leave their host mother's nest at night 
and go meet up with their birth mom or like some other cowbirds and hang out with them at night and I guess learn stuff from them and then they'll go back to their host nest in the morning. It's <laughs> it's super interesting. So they so they they don't have a total lack of parental care. Um, they actually do keep keep tabs on their babies and they can lay a couple dozen eggs in a season. Um, and cowbirds. Get, I think one of the reasons they get a bad reputation is because there's this perception that they kick the young out of the nest. And as far as I know, that's never been documented of a cowbird young kicking a host young or any out of the nest. They do have negative impacts on the fecundity of the host species. So um, if, if a cowbird lays its eggs in a bird's nest, it probably won't be able to lay as many of its own eggs. And the cowbird baby is taking resources from the host mother that could be going to the host um, babies. And so they, they, you know, they're problematic in that regard. And for a number of species, um, like Kirtland's warbler is one, and even Southwestern willow flycatcher, um, the cowbirds could be having an impact on their population for some of these species that are already kind of struggling. But, you know, cowbirds are native, and the reason they've expanded their range so much to cover pretty much all of North America is mainly due to human land use changes. So, you know, we put up fences and now the the large ruminants don't migrate anymore and we cut down a lot of trees in the east and kind of opened up some of these habitats for cowbirds. So they're really adaptable. Um, and I also want to mention that cuckoos do have that breeding strategy where the mother lays the egg in another bird's nest and then the young cuckoos will kick out the, the host nestling or egg, but that is European cuckoos. Um, that is not the yellow-billed cuckoo like we have here. And we do have another, a couple other species of cuckoo in the U.S. We have a black-billed cuckoo and a mangrove cuckoo, and they, they're not the brood parasites like the European cuckoos are. Although they do have an interesting breeding strategy where they have been, um, been known to lay their eggs in other cuckoo's nests and have some sort of kind of a cooperative breeding strategy. So interesting. Anyway, I hope that you have learned something cool about cowbirds, and now you can appreciate them as much as I do. And also, um, they take two years to learn their song. And so they, if you've ever heard them, it's not really a very fancy song, but <laughs> but now if you know, like, oh, they sit there and practice their song for two years, oh, it sounds so beautiful now. Okay, so those were the six species I really wanted to highlight. Um, there's so many cool birds in the bosque. I mean, just beautiful birds, rare birds, common birds, they're all amazing. Um, so I'll just quick go over a few more that if you're out in the bosque this time of year, you're probably gonna see these birds. Um, a cool one that is kind of a, a Southwestern desert specialty is the Phanopepla, and its name is kind of cool. It translates to black shining robe. And this is one of the few birds where it doesn't really have a common name, like Phanopepla is its scientific name, Phanopepla nitens, um, which means black shining robe. But they're really beautiful birds. They're, they're shiny in the sun and they have that really cool raggedy crest and red eye. Um, and they're actually, uh, a lot of people have, um, maybe don't like them so much because they eat mistletoe berries. And so if you ever stroll around the bosque and you see some cottonwood trees that look like they have some sort of strange plant growing on them, it's mistletoe. Um, and it's actually spread by birds and, and phanopeplas and stuff like that. Um, the blue grosbeak is a really beautiful native bird. It's in the cardinal family. Um, can't remember if I mentioned or not, but the, the tanagers, the, the summer tanager is been moved out of the tanager family and is now actually in the cardinal family um, with the blue grosbeak. So these are um, beautiful birds that you're likely to see in the bosque this time of year, along with bullocks, orioles. So you and it, bullocks, orioles are, are are a good one because you actually see those in town a lot. So if you live in a town that's got any kind of riparian habitat or big trees around it, you probably see bullocks, orioles. You can put up um, put up a jelly feeder for them. They really like grape jelly and they also like oranges. So you can get a special feeder to put jelly and oranges in, or you can just kind of cut an orange in half and stab it on a branch in your yard and, and probably get some bullocks orioles coming to your neighborhood. And then the common yellow throat is a cool little songster that's really highly associated with the um, dense riparian habitat that's right on the water's edge. So if you've got some high quality um, coyote willow habitat, like almost the same kind of stuff that the Southwestern willow flycatcher uses, you'll probably see these common yellow throats, um, which are really beautiful and, and really pretty common in the bosque this time of year. So if you wanna see some cool Rio Grande birds, 
um, you, you know, I'm in Socorro County, so we've got a lot of cool stuff in Socorro County. I'm really lucky to live in such a beautiful spot with all these really cool opportunities to see amazing birds. Um, but I just want to highlight some of these places if you're ever in the area or just in the Rio Grande area in particular and, and want to see some of these birds that I've talked about. Um, it's kind of um, it's easy to find good birds in Socorro County. So the first place I want to highlight is the Socorro Riverine Parks and Bosque Trail. And Katie's going to drop a link in the chat box for the Save Our Bosque Task Force, which is a really cool nonprofit that's based out of Socorro County that does riparian restoration and community events. And they also maintain and have implemented all these projects around the riverine parks. And there's a three mile Bosque Trail that goes right along the river. It's like a mile from Socorro. It's, it's a really great resource. And, and most of the pictures in this, in this presentation that were taken by me were taken um, from the Socorro Bosque Trail. And it's a, it's a nice trail, it's flat, it's uh, really well maintained. You can have a picnic there. There's, there's 14 parks that are along the Socorro um, Bosque area for you to use. Um, another place that's great for riparian birds, and that's what this picture is, this is Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge, which is um, globally known for being just an amazing spot for mig migratory waterfowl and cranes specifically. So we have the, the crane festival um, in the fall. It's um, been postponed for this year, but in future years, you know, just keep your eye out for um, Crane Festival information, but just it's a it's a really cool wildlife refuge that has I think over 400 bird species have been seen there. You can go there year round and see all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, another place I like to go birding is Belen Marsh, and this is just a little wetland um, near Belen, New Mexico. So it's north of Socorro, about 45 minutes, and it's not it's it's not a Rio Grande bosque. Um, but it is wetland habitat, and historically the Rio Grande wouldn't have been just a narrow channel with trees just right on the edge. It would have been a really dynamic braided system where you have backwater wetlands, and you have shallow marshes, and you have tall trees, and you have wetland areas and coyote willows. It was um, really, really cool dynamic habitat. Um, and, and now we have some of these small rim, remnant wetlands in the area that are kind of functioning as um, just really good habitat for these these species. So you've got a Belen Marsh, um, one of my favorite birding spots. I've seen um, almost 40 birds there just in an hour of birding there, all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, and then as you keep going north, you can get to the Rio Grande Nature Center in Bosque that's in Albuquerque. And it's just a really cool trail and nature center where you can learn about the Bosque, learn about riparian habitat. And there's just some really nice maintained trails that have a ton of wildlife, ton of birds, cool trails for hiking and biking and just getting outdoors. Um, and I want to bracket this with saying, you know, some, some of these things are open right now and some of them aren't. Um, so like the Socorro Rivering Parks and Bosque Trail are open for you to use, but, um, you know, definitely take precautions and make sure that you check on the status of any of these places before you decide to go check them out and just make sure they're open um, and that you're following the rules. And another place that's really close to Albuquerque is a, a one of the newer refuges in the wildlife refuge system, it's an urban refuge, it's Valle de Oro National Wildlife Refuge, and it's um, in the process of being um, restored basically from an old dairy into a um, kind of a recreated wetland bosque habitat. So um, if you go there now, you'll see some projects in the works. They're working on a new visitor center, they're doing a bunch of tree planting, Audubon's had some um, partnership days with them where we're helping them plant trees and do stuff like that. So that's a cool place to go see some birds and they have a big focus on on community and on um, you know school age kids and stuff like that, all sorts of activities. So if you're in the Albuquerque or Santa Fe or Socorro area, I definitely recommend that um, you, you check out Valle de Oro and some of these other really cool places. Okay, so that's all I have for my webinar. Um, I hope you guys got a lot out of it and learned some cool stuff about birds and hopefully have some questions for me and I'm happy to spend a couple of minutes answering questions. And I also want to mention that um, if you want to learn more about the Rio Grande and our work along the river, I hope you tune in to our third and final of our three-part Rio Grande webinar series, working on the Rio Guan, working for the Rio Grande, um, and this will be 
presented by Quantina Martin, who's our water resource associate, and she's doing a lot of really cool projects with um, aerial imagery and partnerships along the Rio Grande. So her webinar will be on July 21st, so be on the lookout for um, an invitation to that on our Facebook page or um, in your email if you're um, on our email list. So with that, I'll leave you with this picture of some snow geese that I took this um, photo last fall at Bosque del Apache. So um, I mentioned that is one of the top birding spots in New Mexico, actually in the in the whole country. So you can get beautiful photos like this um, when when you get a chance to come come visit. And I really hope that those of you that are in New Mexico or along the Rio Grande will take some time to go try to find some of these beautiful birds. Or if you can't or don't have time or aren't able to. Um, you know, there's so much cool information online. You can totally be a birder and not even go out and look at birds. I mean, you can just research online and look at pretty pictures and, and learn cool stuff about birds. There's so many ways to, to be interested in birds. Um, and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to share some of my knowledge and things I like with you guys. So if you have any questions, Katie's going to be running the chat box for me. Great. Thanks, Amy. We've had a lot of questions coming through in the chat box. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get through all of them, but I've got a couple of pretty birdie uh, questions for you. People are very excited about everything. Um, so one of the first questions we got was from Chris Stoddard, who was asking if these species are seasonal in the bosque or do they live around here year round? That's a really good question. Actually, um, something that I forgot to mention. So most of these species are migratory. So the southwestern willow flycatcher, yellow-billed cuckoo, um, those are migratory. So they were, will only be here during the breeding season. They'll show up around, um, I don't know, June, May, June. Um, they'll breed and then they'll head to Central and South America um, in um, around August or September. So they're, they're only gonna be here during the breeding season. The brown-headed cowbird, of course, you can see it all year. The yellow-breasted chat, um, it's pretty much just here in the breeding season. I think it's one of those species that if it's a, if it's a mild winter, they might stick around a little extra time. Um, the ash-throated flycatcher is a migratory species, so it spends the winter. So I think that's probably true of most of the flycatchers, spend their winter down in Central and South America. Um, and the same with the summer tanager. So I mentioned that it, it was named from a uh, Brazilian tupi word. So those birds um, spend their winters down south, um, like in Venezuela and South America and Central America, and they're really just here during the breeding season. So that's why, that's why like right now is a really great time to go birding. I know people are, are always um, really excited about spring migration and fall migration because you see these species that are just coming through. Um, so you only have like a small couple week or maybe month long window to see some of these birds, but the, but these riparian breeders um, are here right now and probably in the biggest numbers right now. So it's a really great time to go birding. Great. Um, always a good time to go birding, but especially right now, I guess. Uh, so a, a really good question we got from Will Ribbons was, how can we support Southwest Willow flycatchers from our home? Can we do that? Or do they come to feeders? There, how, what can we do to support these birds if we live um, near downtown Albuquerque? Yeah, <laughs> so unfortunately, it's not a bird that would come to your feeder. Um, they're, they're predominantly insect eaters, like, like all flycatchers are, and they're just they are so tightly tied to this riparian bosque habitat. That is the only place they're going to be. And in fact, if you look at some of the survey data that Fish and Wildlife has been compiling since they were listed in, in you know, over 20 years ago, something like um, over 90% of their nests have been found within 100 meters of the river. So they're really, they're, I, I don't think there's any way it could ever be a backyard bird, unless your backyard is the bosque. And there, and there are lots of people that have really cool bosque backyards um, in Albuquerque and, and, and in Socorro County. But um, the, the best thing for Southwestern Willow Flycatcher is just, you know, promoting a healthy riparian ecosystem in general and, you know, promoting strategies that encourage water in the river and water conservation and you know, volunteering for some of these planting days that Audubon and other groups do with Valle de Oro and, and private lands around the area. So 
Unfortunately, I don't think you'll ever see a swivel at your <laughs> at your backyard bird feeder. That would be cool, though. Actually, I've only ever seen them twice, or actually, I've seen them three times. So, you know, I'm out there looking for them, and they're still pretty hard to find. Great. Will says he's going to build a backyard bosque as in response to your <laughs> answer. Um, I like it. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, another question that we had from um, Irene, who was asking, would these bosque birds be seen up in northern New Mexico, kind of closer to Rio Grande del Norte um, and Budo or north, or are these kind of concentrated right around Albuquerque area? So some of these birds you can see pretty much in any riparian habitat. Um, there aren't really very many southwestern willow flycatchers or yellow-billed cuckoos north of um, Cochiti, just because they're so tightly tied with like cottonwood and willow bosques. But a lot of the other species like the ash-throated flycatcher, the tanager, um, the chat are pretty much going to be anywhere where there's brushy or woody habitat that's, that's near water. Um, so yeah, you can definitely see these species, and not just along the Rio Grande, but like in the Gila watershed, um, in pretty much any of these desert riparian areas um, where you have um, water associated with woody vegetation. Yeah, you can totally see these species. And some of them, like the summer tanager, like I mentioned, I see them every single day when I take my dog for a walk with my husband at the New Mexico Tech campus, which is not a wetland and is not managed to be any sort of wildlife habitat, but it's got trees and that's what they're looking for. And it's, you know, there's some ponds there at the golf course that insects emerge out of those ponds. And so I see all the time there, phanopeplas and summer tanagers and flycatchers, not, not willow flycatchers, astroated flycatchers and um, phoebes and things like that. So yeah, it's, these birds definitely aren't associated just with the Albuquerque area of Bosque, except maybe for the exception of the cuckoo and the flycatcher, but they're, they're super rare. I'm not sure if I, if I mentioned it with the cuckoo, but there's only estimated to be 100 to 200 breeding pairs in the entire state. So if you see a cuckoo in New Mexico, you can, you can be really proud of yourself and feel lucky that you saw one. Great. Um, Roselle was just asking, uh, how do you tell the difference between a, like just a regular willow flycatcher and a southwest willow flycatcher? What makes them special? That, that's a that's a hotly contested question, I guess. Um, well, so you know it's a swivel if it's breeding in these riparian western wetlands. So basically, all of the breeding willow flycatchers in New Mexico and Arizona, um, you know, the small remnant populations in California and in the West, they're going to be southwestern willow flycatchers. Um, you will get some of the other subspecies migrating through. So. Um, like I mentioned, there the five subspecies and, and the, the nominant subspecies is really common in the east and, and um, uh, up into Canada. But the southwestern willow flycatcher actually kind of use a little bit different migratory path, so there's not a lot of overlap. But if you see a willow flycatcher um, during the non-breeding season, it, it's really hard to tell them apart. There are some plumage differences. Um, you know, if you if you read any of the species accounts, they're they're really subtle. It's like shading of the wing bars and and really small differences. But actually, when I'm doing a flycatcher survey, um, like an official flycatcher survey using the Fish and Wildlife Protocol, if you just see the bird, it's not really doesn't really count as a sighting unless you hear it because the southwestern willow flycatcher makes that fits you fits you that kind of call. And the other subspecies don't. So if you are out in the bosque and you just see a willow flycatcher, you can't assume that it's a southwestern willow flycatcher unless you hear it. Great. Um, and I guess a kind of a, a good wrap up question. I, we have a few minutes left, but someone um, from Facebook was asking, if you're an avian biologist, uh, do you study diseases that affect both birds and people, which I know is not your job, but do you want to tell us a little bit about what your work looks like, Amy? Yeah, so that, so there's, I mean, many different ways to be a biologist, many different ways to be an avian biologist, and I think most people find themselves kind of specializing in a certain niche of their field. So definitely um, studying disease ecology of birds is is a, a really popular topic of study, especially with things like avian influenza and, 
and things like that. So that that is um, a really important area of study. As far as what I do, um, I was hired on with Audubon to kind of manage or help the the Natural Resource Conservation Service find project areas to do habitat conservation of benefit swiffles. So that's why at the beginning of my talk I said, hey, this is the NRCS program um, and this is what we're doing because um, I'm kind of just trying to promote sound conservation that benefits willow flycatchers, but it also, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get away from like the single species conservation but you kind of get stuck doing that, especially with endangered species. But the good thing about the willow flycatcher is if you can say, this is what the willow flycatcher needs, this is the habitat it needs, this is what we're going to do to promote that habitat, this is how we're going to find people interested to, you know, do some restoration on their land, then you're benefiting all, all the species I mentioned in this talk and more. Um, so that's kind of what I do is, is help landowners and um, interested people find ways to do conservation on their land that benefits um, riparian species. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm trying to see if we have time for maybe one more question. We got a few more minutes. Uh, there's somebody who wants to know, Joan wants to know what kind of camera do you use to take your awesome bird pictures? <laughs> So a lot of the pictures in, in my talk weren't mine. I put the name of the, the author next to them. Um, the, the exception being some of the, the really cool swiffle photo. I know you guys are really impressed by that really tiny little picture of the swiffle. Um, that was actually taken with my phone. But I just use a, a Canon PowerShot SX60. It's a super zoom camera that it's not, it's not the DSLR that has the changeable lenses because um, I just have never gotten into that aspect of photography, but the, the power shot cameras are really common with bird and wildlife photographers because they're easy to use. They're, they're not very expensive. They're about five or $600. Um, they're pretty rugged and you don't have to fiddle with changing lenses and stuff, which is awesome if you want to, you know, go down that route. But for those of us like me who just kind of want to have a, a camera with a big zoom that I can go out in the field and, and take some pretty good photos of birds. That's that's what I use. It's the Canon PowerShot SX60. Great. Thanks, Amy. I know there's a lot more questions, um, but people can go on our website to learn some more and we'll get, get back to you, Desiree, to close this out. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Katie and Amy. Um, this was a really informative talk. For those um, still listening in, be sure to take our survey. The link is in the chat box. And um, that's just gonna let us know how, what we wanna offer in the future, how to improve our programming in the, um, in the future as well. And we dropped a lot of great links in the chat, which are gonna be available on um, the Facebook live stream on the National Audubon Society's Facebook page. We also encourage you to visit our website and sign up for our newsletter where that's where we're going to be sending out a lot more of these links, um, sharing a lot more about Amy and everyone else's work. And so we encourage you to please keep in touch. Um, again, thanks so much for attending and look out for Quinn's uh, webinar in July. If you're on our email list, you'll get notified about that. And um, everyone have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Desiree. Thanks, everybody.